Welcome and thank you for joining us for another episode of Reef in Focus. My name is Connie Rowe and I'll be your host for today. And we're coming to you live from Woolgarukaba and Bindul Lands, the traditional owners of the Townsville region. And today I would like to pay my respects to the more than 70 traditional owner groups up and down the Great Barrier Reef and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging for passing down the traditions and the knowledge that has protected the Great Barrier Reef for many generations and continue to do so for generations to come. Now, today's webinar is all about managing sea country and we will be very fortunate to be joined later on by some people that have had first-hand experience in managing their own sea country. Today's webinar will be recorded and we will be taking questions and answers. So if you do have anything you'd like to ask as we go through, please pop it in your question and answer screen. Now, I'd like to introduce the panellists that are joined with me today. We're joined by Fred Nusifora, our Director for Education and Engagement. G'day, Connie. G'day, everyone. And we've got our CEO of the Reef Authority, Josh Thomas. Thanks for joining us, Josh. Thank you, Connie. Great to be here. Now, guys, it is Reconciliation Week this week, which is such an important week across Australia for all Australians. And Josh, I'd really love to get your perspective on what reconciliation means for you and for the Reef Authority and our colleagues here as well. Sure, look, um, and look, I think Reconciliation Week will probably mean something different to every single person, but it is a really significant week in the Australian calendar every year. For us here at the Reef Authority, it's particularly important. We work with traditional owners, First Nations people, Torres Strait Islanders, uh, every day uh, in our business. We've got several amazing um, traditional owners right here in our own organisation. We're doing a lot through our programs um, for traditional owners along the reef. But I think for me, reconciliation is really about more than just what we do with or for First Nations people. It's about how we do it and really doing it in a way that acknowledges their you know, thousands of years of history, their culture, their expertise, their connection to their country. And I think it's a week where we can all reflect collectively how we um, can share and a better understanding into the future about how we can all walk forward towards reconciliation. Yeah, and there are so many programs. You mentioned um, that it's integrated across through the work that we do here at the Authority. And in my short time at the Authority, just a few years, I've noticed some really strong momentum in some of the partnerships and the relationships that we've been building. Would you mind touching on a few of them and the importance and the opportunities that traditional knowledge draws to our programs? Absolutely. Look, it, it's a fantastic time for the Reef Authority at the moment. Connie, we've got um, a near doubling of the resources going into our traditional use marine resource agreements or TUMRAs for short, it's a bit of a mouthful. Yes, um, but we've got now 43% of the reef is covered by um, TUMRAs partnerships, if you like, with traditional owners on how they manage their sea country. Um, we're doing more through our field management program, which we run jointly with the Queensland government uh, to deliver compliance actions, reef conservation activities, uh, we're investing in sea country mapping work, cultural values mapping, um, and a lot more to look forward to into the future. And for me, it's important that those programs are meaningful, delivered collectively in a really strong partnership, um, because the challenges on the reef are real and we need as many people as possible working on them. And the more we weave traditional owner knowledge into our program, I think the stronger we will be for it. Yeah, definitely. And Fred, your team in the education and engagement team, you spend a lot of time engaging in community and telling stories. How does this integrate into your work? Yeah, thanks. So I, I'm, I'm just admiring how deadly this shirt looks uh, today <laughs> uh, on, this, uh, on this backdrop. So if I'm a bit distracted. But uh, the, the, um, the work that we're doing in education and engagement is, um, you know, it, it with, with traditional owners, it's almost, it's ubiquitous. It's part of everything we're doing now. Um, um, you know, just to name a couple of the, the flagship programs uh, activities on at this point in time, the major transformation of our National Education Centre Reef HQ Aquarium uh, down the end of the street here in Townsville, um, a, a major co-design project going uh, there with the Gurram Bilbara Wulguru Kabar peoples around, you know, the, the welcome to country piece and, and, and embedding um, traditional owner knowledge and information throughout the, the guest experience at Reef HQ 
master reef guide program. We've got traditional owner master reef guides now. Uh, everywhere we have a master reef guide training field school uh, where we are working with the traditional owners of, of those lands at which those field schools are being held to enrich the field school and the training with the cultural awareness part of the training and just a fuller immersion of those frontline tourism staff. Um, so they have a better understanding, appreciation, respect for knowledge and, and, and acknowledgement of traditional owners and connection to sea country that they're taking guests out to. Um, and you know, even through to our, um, our Reef Guardian Council programs, so we have 19 councils along the GBR coast from Woodjul Woodjul in the far north was our first Aboriginal Shire Council to join the Reef Guardian Council program. And, uh, and, and most recently Yarrabah uh, Council has come on board. Um, and for the first time, and it's, it's, been a, it's been a long time coming, we won't gild the lily there, but for the first time this, this, this term with our local marine advisory committees, uh, traditional owners are, are formally recognised as management partners uh, on those and as part of those local marine advisory committees. So you know, just a, a wide array of work happening in that space. Yeah, it does. It touches on so many different areas. And I do want to come back to one that you mentioned, Josh, which is a bit of a tongue twister. It's the traditional use of marine resource agreements. And I guess for our viewers at home, these resource agreements, they are voluntary uh, formal partnerships that are entered into by traditional owner groups. And it's about helping to manage their own sea country. But to give us a little bit more of understanding, we're really fortunate to be joined by someone uh, who's so deeply embedded in this. I'd like to introduce Megan Cummins. Megan is the chair of the Wapabara Tamra. And joining her in the studio today, we have Leon Jackson. Leon's one of the program managers for our Tamra program. And welcome to you both. Thank you for joining us. I'd like um, first, if you could introduce yourselves for us, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about what Tamaras mean to you and um, how it how it's happening in the Wapabara region. Great, thanks very much for that, uh, Connie. Um, I'm Leon Jackson. Uh, with me is uh, Megan uh, Cummins from the Wapabara people. Um, I'm uh, proud Noongar heritage myself from the west coast of this. Uh, massive country and uh, worked over here since uh, I was a young fella. Uh, last 19 years or so, I've worked in the Indigenous space and particularly with people like Megan and also uh, one of our other guests uh, a little bit later on. Uh, so being in, in, on foreign soil, as it were, for me, I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of uh, the Townsville region where we are today, uh, the Bindal and the Wulgarukaba people. Uh, but also extend uh, that acknowledgement to all the traditional owners from the very top of uh, Queensland there, up in the Torres Straits, right the way down to uh, almost the top of Harvey Bay, where uh, the, the reef ends. So, um, yeah, that's me. Uh, Megan, would you like to yeah. uh, say something about yourself? Uh, yeah. Welcome, everybody. Um, so, my name is Megan Cummins. I'm the current chair for our Wapabara Tamra Steering Committee. My connection to Wapabara is my great grandmother is Konomi, and my pickle ancestor is Oyster Maggie. Um, for me, being on Tamra, my guiding principle there is I'd like to take from the words of my grandmother's sister, Nana Ethel Richards was that we do not own the land, we are here as the caretakers. So that's me. Thanks very much, Megan, that's uh, great. Um, look, we, uh, before we uh, talk uh, more about how we work together in the Tumra space, um, I'd like to get your thoughts on reconciliation and, and what that means for you, given that we're smack bang in the middle of reconciliation week here today. Yes. Uh, we started on Friday with the um, anniversary of the 1967 referendum, and then we're finishing this Friday with Mabo Day. Yeah, a lot of people don't realise that we had Thursday. Sorry Day last Thursday as well. Right. So yeah. what, what does reconciliation mean to you in that sense? Um, going back onto the word reconciliation, um, the English word, well, first off, there had to be a relationship, and mm. Keppel didn't have a relationship 
with my people. But I don't like to um, let that be a stain on us as a Bobabara people because we are a very resilient people. And so reconciliation for me is more about healing um, and remembering the removal but rejoicing in the return because it's through their descendants that our ancestors return back on country. So that's what yeah. reconciliation well, for me yeah, means. That's powerful. Look, um, to get a bit of a, a lay of the land, I guess, we'll talk about your country. Um, on screen there uh, behind us is um, what has become uh, one of the uh, pristine uh, fish habitat areas uh, in Queensland. It's called Balbandara Guya in your yes. language. Um, which talks about the fact that it's connection of fresh water, salt water and, and fish. It's uh, otherwise known as Leaks Creek on uh, North Keppel Island, which uh, in your language is called Wapa. Um, yes. Would you like to say a bit about your country? Balban Baraguya is more for us a dreaming place. Um, just going when, whenever we go there, take that time to sit and have our ancestors speak with us, listen to our hearts. So anywhere, as that's anywhere on country is how we'd like to see that, but especially at um, Leeds Creek there. Yeah, wow. Yeah, look, uh, casting your mind back a number of years, back to 2007, yes. uh, you were one of the first groups um, British donor groups in, in uh, the Great Barrier Reef <clears throat> environment to actually develop a Tamra. Um, they, um, as uh, Connie mentioned earlier, they're formal agreements, um, but uh, they, they're also, we partner with the state government and, and yeah. how we work there uh, with the Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service. Um, can you tell us a bit about why Tamra's or your Tamra is important to you? to reflect back on to um, what I said in the very beginning with us, it being that we don't own the land, we are, we are caretakers. So through this Tamra, we are able to have a voice at the table and discuss what is happening on country for us um, through partnerships with Grumper and other permits that may come through. And there's, um, you, you talked about it before too, uh, the physical connection that you have with country, getting back on country. There's a yeah. spiritual element to it as well. Oh, yes. Okay. So there's two things for myself. Um, my spiritual connection, I'd like to first speak of, um, we had a partnership with Fitzroy Basin Association and the uh, Central Queensland University to do a seagrass nursery on Konami Island Environmental Education Centre. Now, part of that was me going out and doing cultural heritage mapping. Um, I jumped off because we, where we were to gather that was just a bit 200 metres out offshore from Considine, which is um, our birthing place in that area and um, I jumped off I'm here taking photos and whatnot and then I reminded myself I'm on country how dare I treat it like tourism <laughs> so I stopped I put my camera down I plant my feet into the sand and I'm nervous because this is a first for me with doing projects and mm. I wanted to know that I was okay with this project, that family was okay with it, our ancestors were okay with it, specifically because it was in that specific special area. And I had asked for forgiveness on how I had arrived and then asked for guidance and to listen to my heart. Two minutes later, I jump back on the boat, we go out to dive again. Now that specific day, I couldn't dive. 
um, but I did see where we were gathering or uh, intending to gather. Um, and Andrews, the principal, he comes up with, a, and he goes, oh, I felt that I need to give you this. And he comes out from the water and he's showing me a heart urchin. And for me, I was like, I asked them to give me a sign, listen to my heart, let me hear theirs. And then I get gifted that. So that gave me guidance and that spiritual connection that they did hear me and that I am okay. So that's why that was important for me. Um, a second one. So, yeah, thank yeah. you for that. Yeah, I guess uh, you touched on a lot of things there that yeah. uh, comes into my next question, which is basically how, how can traditional knowledge and, uh, enrich reef management? With the another experience we had with um, Ames, we did a coral restoration workshop back mm -hmm. in 2017. And it was a week held for a week, and there were 50 traditional owners that were there. And a majority of them, it was the first time back on country. So we learned, um, learned of the coral and obviously from our elders that were present, we also learned about the traditional country there. So as a symbol of gratitude and learning, I designed a choral dance um, to show how connected and the meaning and the similarities of the choral growth to how we are. So you'll see on the screen, the beginning is all the choral together and we are waiting for a full moon. So we're waiting and we see that full moon and then the, they're spawning out. We go across the seabed. And that, to me, reflected how we waited on the beach and then we were all forcibly removed. We didn't find our way. We were spread out throughout Queensland, having to find home. So then we're now down into the ground, finding home. Then we're back on country. So we're digging in. We're finding home. And then we found it, so we celebrate it that there's a connection there. We are home. Very powerful story. Thank Very you. powerful. Thank you. Um, look, besides the Tamara, are there other ways that uh, you're working um, with us, the Reef Authority? Yes, so we devise um, cultural heritage mapping. So we, what that means is we go out um, onto sites that are where permits have been asked to go and do studies. And Grandpa um, speak with us in regards to where they're wanting it done, finding out whether it's a clear area, if it's not in a buffing zone, uh, in things like that. Um, there's no artifacts there that need to be removed or left there and the project then other permit then is defined um and yeah so the processes and the benefits of those things are that that cultural heritage mapping is done by um the traditional custodians themselves and um, that's important for our people because we are able, as a Tamara Steering Committee, able to go back to our family and say, yes, we have, they might, for example, hear that something's happening yeah. Yeah. around Monkey Point or something where there's another sacred area and we can, uh, Monkey Beach, sorry, and we can say, yes, we are fully aware of that. We know and they're nowhere near. We've made sure that yeah. those things yeah. are happening. And that, that was great. You were the uh, first group that we actually worked with to put together those heritage impact assessment yes. guidelines that we follow now and uh, working with other groups to do that. Is, um, before I go back to uh, Cody, is there anything else you'd um, like to add before we go back to the panel, Megan? Yeah, so um, before we go back to the panel, I'd like to um, ask for everyone that's tuned, tuning in today and for those on the panel as well, 
um, I'll ask our creator and ancestors guidance that we leave with the message to pass on. Country is more than a place. It is inherent to identity, sustaining our lives in every aspect, spiritually, physically, emotionally, socially, and above all, culturally. Thank you. Thank you very much, Megan. Thank you very much, Sharon, for taking the time to come today. <laughs> yes. uh, uh, back to the panel. Thanks, Leon. Thanks, Megan. That was really, really insightful. And it's it's so valuable for us as well, having these connections on country, in location, mm -hmm. and being able to have the eyes there to be managing that sea country. We really appreciate it. I guess it's really important to reinforce for our viewers as well that um, there are many Tumras up and down the coastline and not one of them is identical. They're all in place for many different reasons. And um, we have had one recently acknowledged and set up. Uh, we're joined by, uh, from Durumbul country, Mal Malcolm Mann. Um, Mal, welcome for joining us today and congratulations on the Durumbul Tumra being put into place. Um, I recognise that it's actually the largest Tamra that has been put into place to date, but it's not the sheer size that is the really exciting thing for you guys, is it? Could you please touch on us for us, what it means having the Tamra in place for the Durumbul people and for yourself? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Connie. Thanks for having me into the Reef Authority as well. And certainly my acknowledgements to the, the, the Great Barrier Reef traditional owners, custodians uh, that share this wonderful space. Uh, it's certainly exciting for Durumbul. Um, it's um, it's so having a, the, the Tumra now um, is uh, uh, both exciting, but it's it's really showing intent of our movement towards uh, moving into the sea country space. So um, we've been in that space for a while, but um, we're really formalising this sort of new dimension of work that we see that's coming on board. Um, so Darnell's fairly excited about that. Um, and also working in partnership too with Wapabar and um, uh, neighbours to the south. So, um, you know, that's, I think, combined with three Tumra groups combined, that's a really good, uh, clear statement of, um, you know, TAs themselves um, looking to really advance in the marine space. So we're excited about that. And so what kind of opportunities does this lead for you guys? Where where do you see yourselves going over the next few years? I think there's certainly two parts to it. One is we're um, uh, putting legs to the Tamara, um, yeah, putting legs to the Tamara, particularly in the sense where um, we've, you know, we've set out implementation tasks as part of the Tamara agree agreement. Uh, so we'll certainly move and tick those items as we progress through, but certainly um, capitalise any opportunities in terms of programs or projects that's occurring in our waters as well, um, with uh, presenting opportunities, exposure of experiences for our um, country men and women to work and operate in, uh, in our sea country space. But the two big items is, is that of employment. Uh, we, we need dedicated effort on country um, to extend our reach and effectiveness on ground. And the other one is around securing contracts, so uh, fee-for-service arrangements, uh, noting that there's a lot of activity uh, that's happening on land-based in the Darnbull space, but uh, over time with transition and, and transfer of knowledge and experiences, uh, really move into the marine space. So that, that's, Darnbull's pretty excited about that, yeah. And you're doing so much um, in inspiring your future generations as well. Um, there's, I understand there's the Brolga program that you're working with. Could you um, let us know a bit more about that? Yes, yeah, so the Brolga program, um, um, there's certainly a cultural story behind that from my grandfather um, and that. So um, it's a cultural based um, youth program um, that we um, uh, sort of target students from ages 10 through to 17 so school years um, and provide them opportunities in an indigenized fashion um, 
are linking in with partners. So one of which is uh, locally, Seeker University. So uh, demystifying university there, bringing the community into the university space um, and also providing the university and, and those and, and different partner settings, uh, are giving them some cultural experiences as well. So, um, you know, so that when decision time comes for students as they progress through their schooling, that um, some of the, the terminologies around um, future pathways isn't a foreign concept to them. Um, and, you know, and so it's really good to provide um, visual context for some of our students around professionals working in, in uh, mainstream. Um, so, you know, for us, it's not just about having ranges, it's about having policy makers, scientists, um, people in a whole raft of different um, touch points in the in the workforce and in, in, in various industries around about the place. It's not just about the environment too, because because uh, the whole suite of community sectors that uh, a lot of our people, uh, Durable people, and other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, would like to you know find ways and, and uh, ways of connection. So Brolga is certainly a connector, um, and um, it's repositioned now here within Darnell Enterprises. So we've just got a project coordinator on board. Um, who's actually um, part of the cultural story of the Brolga is uh, my son. So <laughs> there's a bit of an expectation there, <laughs> um, but it's, but he's, yeah. So there's a really important uh, vein of, um, so just teaching them one animal, teaching them one animal or how that animal, um, in a cultural way, um, how that animal can teach us a lot about life. So, um, and Brolga is one of those things. Um, and it connects between, in the whole environment. So um, in, the, in, in water, in aquatics, in um, the air, so climate change, um, uh, insects, animals, you know, so Brolga is one of those animals we can teach culturally. Um, uh, and scientifically, and that sort of thing. So whenever they see a brolder in the environment, it reminds them about certain events. It reminds them about things. So uh, setting up triggers is really important for young people. Hey, Mal, it's Fred, mate. Um, I've just got a, there's a question that just came through from Aisha uh, online. And I, I think it's, it's, it's a wonderful uh, point to ask this question of you now. Um, you've spoken about the Brolga program yeah, it's all about intergenerational change. It's a big piece of what we're trying to deliver here through our education programs too. The, the question was, um, across the Great Barrier Reef, there's lots of community playing and working uh, on, on country, on the Great Barrier Reef. What ways can everyday people, um, what can they do to you know, better recognise, understand um, country, traditional owners, uh, and the cultural importance of that country and pay their respects to it? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, you know, one of the privileges that we have as Australians and, and, and even for neighbouring traditional owners or wherever, what I love is being able to visit someone's country and they, they through their own... Um, because, yeah, when you, when you access country with traditional custodians, they will tell you what you need to know. Yeah. And so, and there's, um, and it's, it's, so it's highly regulated, but it's, it's all by, it's all per protocol as well. So I think what's really key for anyone that's interested in, in connecting with Melbourne countries is knowing who to connect to. And so I think that's where Tamas really play a really important role uh, around uh, the contact and uh, because yeah, it, it's often that 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 case where I don't know who to talk to. I'm not. I don't know where to start. And Tamas actually provides that conduit, the communication pathway. And so I, I certainly recommend for our viewers to, um, if you happen to be in a Tamar region, in a Tamar area, uh, is to find is to, is to make contact with the uh, um, the primary Tom. Um, I'm a contact holder there and, and be brave, be brave, make the contact um, and, and, and find out firsthand from the traditional owners from that area 
and they'll be more accommodating. And that's always part of the fabric of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture is to show your country. Yeah, so um, accessing country and you'll learn a lot. It's not just about the country, but social things, health, you know, all sorts of knowledge, yeah, and protocol, you know, how to, how to operate it, how you position in that place. Yeah, so, um, so that's, that's really important. Excellent. Thanks, yeah. Mel. Thanks, thanks, Mel. Megan, did you have anything that you wanted to add to that question as well? Um, how everyday people can help and interact. And is there anything you want to leave us, leave our viewers with today? Yes. Yeah, so, um, on echoing Brother Malcolm's words there, but also um, to keep in mind, like nothing changes if you change nothing. And in the theme of reconciliation now, be strong, be brave, you know, um, stand up, show up, speak out, embrace respect, you know, connecting through cultural protocols, country and countrymen. Thanks, Megan. Um, is there any final words you'd like to leave us with today, Malcolm? I just don't think it's that. Yeah, it's it's about being brave. Like being brave is is about being courageous too. So, um, you know, and there's a lot of challenges out there. Um, we, we mentioned um, previous that Tumras is actually a reconciliation tool. It's a healing instrument as well uh, around accessing country. That's a cultural value in itself. Is is access the country. Um, sitting on country and, and the words that uh, Megan mentioned was just spot on around um, and our old people talk about it too about that country has its own language it has its own voice we often get so busy in our heads busy with programs and schedules and things have got to be here and there but just to take the opportunity to sit down on country and let country speak to you I think um, and you don't have to be indigenous you know so um, I think that's a really important thing too, is just to be able to connect, um, sit on country. But, you know, having the, 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 the opportunity to sit on country with traditional custodians is something that should be on everyone's bucket list. And, that, uh, and um, you know, so look at that beautiful part of the world over there, Wobbleboro country there. See my part of the world here. So, I mean, um, there's some areas of country, we're not going to take you there because it's too good. <laughs> <laughs> but there's there's, um, <laughs> but there's there's country that uh, we'd like, love to be able to share with you, you know, and, and, and uh, but with country is all about responsibility as well. And so it's really important that we all have an obligation um, to look after country. So, um, yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, Mal. And thanks, Megan, as well. Um, it's so, so beautiful and such an important thing for us all to remember as well. I think we get so caught up in our everyday lives and the hustle and bustle and just taking those moments out, like being in touched on, like taking away from being that tourist and just sitting back in the moment and appreciating where you are and developing those relationships and with the people around you, with the land around you. I, it's really so special and how much you can get out of that experience as well not just for yourself but giving back to country too so um i'd like to on behalf of us here in the studio thank you both for joining us today um it's been so insightful hearing from your perspective how much country means to you and what reconciliation means to you as well and um I'd really like to celebrate the work that you're doing in this space and to all our partners in this space as well and at on behalf of the Reef Authority, we really look forward to continuing this relationship working with you guys. Is there anything from you or Fred, Josh, that you'd like to? Look, <clears throat> Connie, just to say thank you, um, Mal. Thank you, Megan. Um, thanks, colleague Leon, um, for walking us through some of your experiences. It, you know, whether it's the beautiful way you describe your own experiences in connection to country. Um, you know, Megan, you said we're only here for a short time and we're looking after these precious places for the next generations, um, whether it's about standing up, being brave and making the change as per Reconciliation Week. I think we've all learned something a little bit more today 
And that's all part of that reconciliation walk, part of managing these special places together. So thank you all very much for your time. And for a brother, you can show me those special places, eh, Mel? <laughs> yeah, where, the, where those big bucks are. Brother. Come on. <laughs> one day, one day. We won't, we won't put you on the spot for that one, Mel. But thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We really appreciate you tuning in. Um, as I mentioned at the start, this webinar has been recorded and we'll circulate that to you shortly. Uh, please feel free to share it with friends, family, colleagues, um, to let them listen in. And we hope that you'll enjoy us, for, join us for our next episode as well. We will be sending out a questionnaire. We do really appreciate your feedback too. So if you could take the time for us and let us know what you thought of today's episode, that'd be great. Thanks. And we will see you at our next episode of Reef in Focus. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye.